Okay. Uh, for those who don't know or have ever heard of me, my name is Bill Hillhouse. I live in Erie, Pennsylvania. I am 39 years old, and I have never played a game of baseball in my life. I have only ever played fast food softball. Now that's pretty unbelievable for an American-born kid. But, let me add to it. I started pitching when I was 12 years old. And this is before the era when boys would sue to play in girls' sports and girls would sue to play in boys' sports. And so, if I wanted to pitch, I had to pitch in the men's leagues. And a lot of people didn't know that there is actually men's fast pitch softball, but there is, and there's a pretty high level of it in some places. Uh, I pitched in the men's league when I was 12 years old for the first time. Now, fathom that for just a minute. Imagine you got a 12-year-old daughter, or you're a coach of a 12-year-old ASA team, and your girl wants to pitch. So what are you going to do? You're going to put her in a women's softball league and make her play against college players, NPF players, Jessica Mendoza's, people of that caliber. That's how I had to learn how to pitch. And it was chuck and duck. Throw it and duck on a lot. I mean, that's how I like to learn. And I never played baseball in my life. That's all I ever wanted to do was pitch softball, and so that's all I ever did. So, a little bit about myself and my background is my team is based in New York City. I live in Erie, Pennsylvania. Travel softball for men's softball is a little bit different for women than it is for girls. I live in Erie. I board a plane every Friday, fly to wherever my team is playing. Our catcher might live in Florida. Our shortstop lives in Tennessee. Our second baseman lives in New Zealand. Another guy lives in Canada. Everybody just meets in that location, and that's how we all kind of get together and play. We don't play league games anymore. We don't play, uh, we don't even really play any home games. Our games are just all tournaments at, at the world and national level. And uh, YouTube at some time, you guys will be amazed at what you see with, with men's fast pitch softball. It's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Um, I played on the US national team. A lot of people don't know that there's a men's team for the national team, and there is, just like there is for the women's team, except the men's softball was never in the Olympics. It's only ever been in the World Championships, the ISF World Championship, and of course in the Pan Am Games. So I've been a member of the US team for that too, back when I was a little bit younger and healthier. Um, and uh, so my experience is, is pretty far-reaching. Um, I really emphasize that with girls that I work with because I want them to understand that everything they're going through as a pitcher, I've been through it myself. I've tried every grip of the ball, I've tried every pitching motion, I've tried every pitching style, I've tried every pitching delivery, I've tried everything you can imagine because this is all I ever did. And so what I do now and what I teach now is entirely based off what I've learned through my life of pitching. I don't teach anything that I don't actually do myself. And there's a lot of pitching coaches who don't make that claim, or can't make that claim. A lot of famous pitchers who go around and do clinics and instruction, they teach things that they don't actually do themselves when they pitch. And they may not realize that they're doing it, but they do. And I'm gonna kinda of talk about some of those things. One of the things that I really do that I get notarized for a lot is that I simplify pitching. And the way I do that is by looking at the audience. There's a lot of guys in this audience. And has anybody in this crowd of men ever played fast pitch before? One, two. Two guys. Were you pitchers? No. One was, one wasn't. Okay. So, people here in the crowd, folks. If you have a basic understanding of how our bodies work when you watch a baseball pitcher throw, you have a basic understanding of how our bodies work when we throw a softball. It's basically the overhand throwing motion turned upside down. Now we're going to apply a lot of similarities and a lot of common sense to how we warm up and how we pitch and how our bodies are designed to move. Okay? So, what I teach. Where a lot of pitching coaches go wrong is they teach their own personal pitching style as though it's an absolute, you must pitch this way. And that's not right. It's absolutely not right. There are certain points in our motion when we have to be in the same positions. Everybody has to be in the same positions. If you put me side by side with Cat Osterman or preferably Jenny Finch, <laughs> you would see that in, in certain points in our pitching motion, we get ourselves into identical positions. A lot of pitcher coaches, a lot, excuse me, a lot of pitching coaches, female pitching coaches, a lot of female pitching coaches, 
tell a lot of people, and, and, and there's a, there, I shouldn't even say that. Let me, let me back up and say it this way. There's a very big misconception out there that men and women need to pitch differently, or do pitch differently. And I'm here to kind of expel that rumor and that myth. There shouldn't be any difference. Our bodies are designed pretty much to work the same way when we move. So we've got to understand how those things are designed to move and, and to utilize it. And we teach girls to throw overhand the exact same way as boys. They're being taught to swing bats now the exact same way as boys. They're running bases the exact same way as boys. Why, when it comes to softball pitching, should it be any different? And what a lot of people say, oh, well, men are stronger. They can do things. They can do things because they're so much stronger than girls. This, this is not about muscle. If this was about muscle, I would not look like this. This is about understanding our bodies and how they're designed to move. And it all begins with how we warm up. We've got to understand that what we do when we warm up affects what we do when we pitch. Okay? But again, I'm going to talk about this choices versus the must. Things that we have to do versus things that we choose to do. And a good example of that, Pat Osterman, when she goes to pitch, she does something like this. She goes up over her head, she comes down, and she pitches. Personally, I see absolutely no point in bringing the ball up over my head when I gotta come back down and go all the way back up again. A lot of wasted motion there. I simply start right here, I get myself started, wind up. I got myself into the exact same position she did, but we had a different style in which we did it. One is not right, one is not wrong, it's a choice. But the absolute is that we got ourselves into the same position. So those are things that are non-negotiable because our bodies are designed to work. We need to get our upper half of our body loading our lower body. We want to try to use the rubber like a starter block for a sprinter. So when a sprinter gets themselves ready, they load up, they get themselves set, and they push off. We had a different way in which we did it. So one isn't right and one isn't wrong, but it's, it would be wrong for me to say you have to pitch this particular way or with this particular motion. There's certain things that can harm their pitching motion, and that's one of the things that I make sure that I go over with all pitchers and parents and coaches, is I want to make sure that their own personal style of pitching does not affect the absolutes that they need when they pitch. If it is, then we got a problem. And I'm going to talk about some of those in just a second. If you take a look, there's me and me, and there's Pat in a game. And this picture right here is going to illustrate how you'll see that we get ourselves into identical positions in midair. Probably the key point in the motion is midway through. And we're in absolutely identical positions. Obviously, she's left-handed. Mechanics comparison, the common sense approach. We've got to understand that if we're not using our body the way it's designed to move, we're not going to get the most from it. One of the biggest examples of that, again, going into warm-ups, is how many times have we all seen pitchers who warm up doing wrist flips? It's a common practice in most places. Everybody thinks, oh, you've got to warm up doing wrist flips. And you see them doing it this way, and you see them doing it this way. Think about this for just one second. If that makes sense to you, why don't you ever see a baseball pitcher warm up going? <laughs> Everybody laughs at that, but that's the same exact thing. When somebody's teaching themselves wrist flips, what they're teaching themselves is to pitch with a straight arm, locking their elbow <coughs> and to use their wrist only. That would be like teaching somebody to throw overhand, like this. When somebody throws a ball overhand, their elbow needs to bend and snap. Underhand, my elbow needs to bend and snap. You'll see key points in the positions, myself and Danielle Laurie, pretty close to similar positions. Her glove goes up a little bit higher than mine. Side view, you can see how my elbow is cocked and ready to snap. Jenny Finch's elbow is getting ready to cock on the way down. She has a straighter arm than I do in her arm circle. Choice, I don't lock my elbow at any point. My elbow stays loose so that I can get a whipping motion just like throwing overhand. Elbows loose so that I get a whipping motion. Troubleshoot. The easiest thing to teach a pitcher is why the ball goes where it goes when they throw it. 
troubleshooting for any pitcher at a young level is key. As if you're a parent or if you're a coach, one of the worst things that you can do is say something to a pitcher every single time she throws a ball. Every time you throw a ball, you say something to her, you teach, you, you got to correct or modify what she's done, a couple things are going to happen, none of which are good. Number one, she's going to learn to tune you out. She's not going to listen to you after a while. Or number two, she's going to become dependent on your feedback. And every time she throws a ball, she's going to look at you to make sure that what she's done is okay or she needs reinforcement or correction. What I really try to do with pitchers is I try to teach them why the ball goes where it goes when they throw it. If they know that, then they know how to correct it. The simple philosophy that I have them follow is that throwing the ball high or low is a timing issue. Inside and outside is a mechanics issue. It doesn't get any more simple than that. If they're throwing inside or outside, they have a mechanics problem. If they're going high or low, they have a timing problem. Best example of that is here's when a pitcher comes through, one of the things that they've been taught, and this is a pitching style that gets taught a lot, and again, we're going to go back to the overhand motion in just one second, but where a lot of young girls get taught control problems from the very beginning has to do with this motion here, where they come and they bring their arm straight up like this. And they bring their hip and their hand through at the exact same time, and they bring their arm straight up like this. Now, everybody here has seen a girl pitch like this. But nobody here has ever seen anybody throw a ball overhand like this. Power in any sport that you play is done at an angle. It is not done straight ahead. When you throw a ball overhand, your arm does not go straight down. You serve a tennis ball, your arm does not go straight down. Your arm snaps across. If you're boxing and you're going to jab somebody, you go straight. You're going to knock somebody out, boom, you go across your body. Power is done at an angle. So from the very start, not only are they being taught to not utilize their body in an effective way because their arm bends instead of snaps, but the direction of the pitch gets lost because as I'm looking at my catcher and I've got to close my hips at the exact same time as my hand comes through, I'm now going to go around my body. A lot of inside pitches. A lot of, a lot of girls with right-handed throw a lot of inside pitches to right-handed batters because they go around their body, not through their body. Okay? So what I make them do, understanding that the inside pitch happens because their arm did not touch their belly button. If their arm comes through and touches their belly button, then the ball goes wherever my shoulder points. So if my shoulder gets pulled out of line, that's where the ball goes. Shoulder straight, that's where the ball goes. So outside pitches, same as a baseball pitcher, premature pulling their shoulder out, they throw outside pitches. Us, if my shoulder's offline, boom, that's where the ball's gonna go. Shoulder goes straight, ball goes straight. Shoulder goes out, ball goes out. So inside pitches mean that they went around their body with their arm, they didn't go through their body. So I tell them, arm needs to touch the belly button. Outside means, again, if their shoulder was offline, the number one cause of a pitcher who pulls their shoulder out a lot is because they go swimming. Their glove goes out, pulls their body offline. So we've got to know how to fix that. What happens? Why do they do it? Real simple test for them. Have them grab a ball, put their glove on, and see if they can throw the ball right into their own glove. If they're pulling their shoulder up, they won't be able to catch the ball. It's going to force them to keep the glove hand right in line with the body. And they can work on multiple things at the same time. Pitchers who are trained to do this, by practicing and throwing the ball into their own glove, they're going to be able to work on snapping their elbow as opposed to bending their elbow. This is going to come back into the next session when I start going into the, the, the mechanics of how we throw pitches, because I want to make sure I'm very clear on something here too. Nothing that I'm saying to you guys is anything that I invented. I didn't invent anything here. I didn't create anything here. I don't have a patent on anything here. Everything that I'm talking about right now is what I learned and was taught to do myself. I did not invent anything here. So you can't walk out of here and go, your way of doing this is not my way. This is not my way. What we've seen with the pictures, that if you look at all the top pictures in the world, they're all doing very similar things. 
So you gotta ask yourself, if your pitching coach is teaching her to go like this, why aren't the best pitchers in the world doing that? And I'm gonna show you a clip in just a second to prove my point. Best female, I'm ahead of myself there. The best pitchers in the world, male and female, get themselves into the exact same positions. We gotta make sure that we don't confuse the musts with the styles. Another common example of a style choice is a pitcher, and a lot of girls do this. They go back like this, okay? Now, three, potentially four bad things happen when a pitcher does this. <clears throat> Number one, the minute she drops out of her glove, her elbow locks. And now we're right back into that muscle memory thing where they're taught to pitch with a stiff arm and they're using their wrist only. Almost every pitcher that does this, where they lock their elbow, gets really sore in their shoulder right here. If you have a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 16-year-old pitcher, and they're chronically sore, and they're always having to ice because they're sore, listen, these kids should be able to do this all day, every day. I know I did when I was a kid. Getting sore means that they're overusing something. They're not dispersing what's going on here through the rest of their arm because their arm is locked. And it's locked because they're trained to lock it from the beginning. Just like we need our elbow to be bending, we need our elbow to be bending this way too. So, first thing that happens, they lock their elbow. Second thing that happens, as soon as she drops out of her glove, she shows the grip of the ball. She shows the batter the ball, she shows the coaches the ball, she shows everybody the ball. And I can guarantee you that that girl doesn't want her catcher to give signals like this, okay? So if the catcher's doing her part to hide the signals, we as a pitcher need to do our part to hide the ball. And if we're not doing that, we're doing ourselves a very big disservice. How many here watched the Women's College World Series on TV this year? Almost everybody. Everybody here probably watched the Alabama pitchers doing this, okay? Why were they doing that? Because the third base coach is staring right into her glove, and if she gets her grip right here, he or she is gonna to signal to the batter what pitch is coming. And if they know what pitch is coming, that's half the battle. It's half the battle. They know a changeup's coming, forget about it. They know a rise ball's coming, forget about it. The bats and the balls are using today, slappers are hitting 300 foot home runs with the bats and the balls are using today. I don't want them to know what pitch I'm gonna throw. Alabama pitchers kind of went to hell with the joke with doing this big twist thing. They don't need to do that. All I do personally when I'm going to get myself started is I take the heel of my glove, put it right on my hip bone. Face of my glove goes into center field. I get my grip right there. The reason I don't do this and just hide it from the third base coach is because the first base coach will look in and see what I'm doing. So I need to hide what I'm doing from both coaches. I do not load my glove. By that I mean a lot of young girls, and again, it's just because they're not taught from the very start how to do these things. These are very basic things, but they load their, does anybody have a ball by any chance in their bag or anything? The one thing I did not bring was a ball, and this isn't a ball. This is, a, this is kind of a double ball. And a lot of pitchers, by loading, what they do is they'll get their grip right at their hip, and then they load up their glove and they pitch. They throw their drop, they go, and then they're going to throw their change up, you see them load them like this. And most of the girls in the dugouts are beating water bottles up against the fence, and they're singing, and they're chanting, and they're doing things, and they're not. If they were to just stop and look at what those pitchers are doing, probably 80% of them load their glove. They get their grip, and they bring it right here, and then they pitch, and then they drop out, and they show you again. Okay. So, one of the reasons that if you look at the College World Series numbers, statistics, look at how many home runs these girls are hitting now. Home runs, home runs, home runs, home runs, home runs. Part of it is attributed to the bats and the balls. Part of it is attributed to the fact that more and more guys who play fast pitch are getting into the men, women's game and they're teaching girls how to read pitchers. Crystal Bustos will tell you that. Jessica Mendoza will tell you that that they are taught how to pick pitchers and read pitchers. And there's no need to even pick somebody when they're just loading up their glove or they're dropping out of their glove like this. We've got to try to hide what we're doing, okay? Now, I've talked about two reasons. Number one, they lock their elbow. Number two, they show off the ball. The third reason, and this is probably the most important reason, 
When a pitcher swings her hand back like this, most of the time, they do nothing with this hand right here. Their glove hand stops right at their waist and they bring their glove hand back. Finch is about the only one I know of that actually swings both hands back. Most of them swing one arm back and they stop the glove hand. So now, when they go forward, they're only pushing forward with one arm. But if you asked any one of them to try to jump up and touch the ceiling, they would go both arms. If you told them to run as fast as they can down the hallway, they would use both arms. They swing a bat, they use both arms. Why in pitching then do they only use one half of the body? I don't know. Most pitchers that do this, again, they get sore, and when they make the conversion from doing this to doing something like this, where they keep their hand in their glove, they feel like they pitch faster when they do this. They don't actually pitch faster, but they feel like they do because they're tensing up and using muscle in their shoulder. And we're going back to it. This is not about using muscle. This is about using leverage, snap, timing, and our bodies, the way they're designed to move. So, keeping my elbow and my, my elbow tucked in, my hand on my glove, I bring my hands back together, and I push them forward together. I'm gonna throw the ball harder because I'm gonna be using more of my legs because both halves of my body are utilizing my, mo my weight, my momentum. The fourth thing that happens when a pitcher does this a lot of times is the minute the hand separates, the glove hand then becomes free, and when that glove hand becomes free, they smack themselves. They swim out with their shoulder, they, their glove goes crazy, they have no control of the glove hand, and a lot of times they smack themselves. And I always ask pit, back, you know, pitchers that hit themselves, like, well, why do you do that? And a lot of times they don't realize that they're doing it, and sometimes they're told that, that I get told that they're taught to do it. I said, well, why would somebody teach you to hit yourself? You walk down the street hitting yourself in the head, and they go, no, but it's a timing mechanism. I can smack my leg, and I know that's when I'm supposed to release the ball. And I'll say to them, okay, but you're also telling the batter when you're releasing the ball. They're, you're going to be able to use that against you at some point in time, at some level of play, not at the tenue level, but at some level of play, that is going to be worked and used against you. And it is. It will be. So I see no point in teaching a girl to do something at 10 years old that at 16 I'm going to have to tell her, oh, okay, now we got to do something totally different. We're going to unlearn everything that you've learned up to this point, and we're going to try to teach you to do it a different way. I want them to start from the very beginning, understanding that they need their elbow to whip, and I don't want them to show the ball, I don't want them to lock their elbow, I need them to make sure that they're using their legs to their fullest, and I want this all to start from the very beginning, not from doing it differently. Different stages. 10 you, I'm going to do it this way. 12 you, I'm going to do it this way. 12. Again, understanding that they get to pick their own personal pitching style as long as it's not affecting the things that the body needs to do. Okay? The arm circle. You see Monica here? Two parts of the arm need to touch two parts of the body. Otherwise, we're not utilizing our body. I try to get them to make sure that their bicep touches their ear, forearm touches the belly. If those two parts of my arm touch those two parts of my body, I know my arm went in a straight circle. If I'm not touching my arm to my ear, then my, I have a gap between my arm and my ear. Pitchers who do this have an extraordinarily high rate of getting shoulder pain from the scapula up into the rotator cuff. Our arms are not made to work in oblong circles. Not for very long, they're not. I want them to try to make sure they come up as close to the ear as they can, and then down as close to the belly as they can. Out here means that they're not getting the full arm circle, and they're setting themselves up for some shoulder pain. So we want to really try to eliminate that as much as we can right from the start. So arm circle is important. We want to make sure, again, bicep to the ear, forearm to the belly. The feet. There is a ginormous difference between my footwork and Jenny Finch's footwork. In a perfect world, we want to drag our tiptoe. Leaping and crow hopping is illegal because it allows a pitcher to have absolutely no resistance on the ground and to get out further and release the ball from a much closer distance. 
What I want is to try to go right to that line without going over the line. And that means that I'm going to try to drag my toe down, shoelaces facing my catcher. If my shoelaces face in a direction other than my catcher, then I'm going to have more foot on the ground. You can see where Jenny's feet, she's got her whole foot down there. Her whole foot is collapsed. It almost looks, you look at that and you go, how are you? It looks like she's breaking her ankle. A lot of girls do that. A lot of girls do that. And a lot of girls start doing that from the beginning of their push off, and I'll get into that in just a second. You see in my picture, I'm actually have my toe down, I'm, I'm airborne in that picture. There was a big hole there, that's why. So that's why. Yeah. But you see how my toe is down, and I'm making sure that I drag just my tiptoe as much as I can, because I want the least amount of foot on me down on the ground as possible. More foot is more of an anchor. Less foot means you're going to be able to glide and get more distance towards the catcher. The finish. Now we're at the finish. Pitchers, you see this. Girls doing this. Girls being taught to do that. Where's Michelle Smith's arm? Mid-motion, you see her. Her arm is snapped. Jenny Finches. Her arm, you can see it, it's starting to cross her body. You watch Jenny Finch, if you go home and you do a YouTube video of Jenny Finch. We looked today for as many pictures as we could of Jenny Finch releasing the ball. Not one dad on earth took a picture of that face of Jenny Finch when she's, they all got the glamour pictures or Jenny's looking at the camera like this and there's very few. But if you look at the, the actual video of watching Jenny Finch throw, she does this. She snaps her elbow, and then brings it back in some kind of, almost like a jerk motion, she goes back like this. But the release happens as she whips it. Michelle Smith does the exact same thing. Her arm snaps. Everybody snaps their arm across their body when you're throwing the ball overhand or underhand when you're trying to get the most power from it. It's how we're designed to move. I mean, again, I, I can cite more sports where you think of how, our, how we get power Field goal kickers no longer run up and kick straight on, they go at an angle. And they come running up and boom, watch how their foot goes when they kick. So, I want them to have a relaxed, loose elbow. I don't want them to have a stiff, bent elbow. Big difference in the two. Huge difference in the two. <coughs> drills. I have a pitcher do three drills, and only three drills. And they're all designed to be the way she's going to pitch when she actually pitches. I'm not a believer in knee drills and wrist flip drills and all kinds of things that isolate and break down the motion so much that it makes it harder for the pitcher then to put it all together. I want her to work on her timing and her snap from the start to the finish of her pitching motion. So in her warm-ups, I have her do three things. First one, start off sideways. Arms and legs move together, up together, down together, just like that. Nothing complicated about that at all. Main thing to think about is it's not for speed. So you got to make sure that you tell girls, and girls especially, young girls, they have two speeds, on and off. They don't understand slow motion. You try to tell a girl to go slow motion and she goes 200 miles an hour instead of 800 miles an hour. Slow motion, and because they want to try to throw the ball 100 miles an hour, they go, way up and then down and they snap it as hard as they possibly can. I don't want the glove hand to go above my shoulder. When I pitch in a game, my glove hand does not go up above my shoulder. So I don't want to warm up doing that. I want them to look like a letter K. Up together, down together, just like that. And as she's doing it, she's not only working on the rhythm of her arms and legs moving together, she's working on her shoulder staying pointed to her target, her elbow snapping as she comes through her, her release point, her stomach, and she can also be working on the toe drag. Bringing the foot straight up, toe down, laces point to the target, knees come together. <clears throat> if you're catching for your pitcher and you notice that her knees are not coming together, you have a pitcher that is pitching around her body. She's falling off her line. If she simply drags her foot straight forward, she's staying much straighter and aligned to the catcher, Odds are she's going to throw a straighter pitch. If her body's going offline, she's, going to, she's doomed. She's going to be falling all over. She's got her body going multiple directions. She's going to have to make corrections in order to get the ball to go straight again. A lot more things going wrong. 
And again, all of these things are related. Every part of the pitching motion is related, and it comes full circle when it comes time to throw the pitches. When it comes time to throw the pitches. And I hope everybody sticks around for that because I'm going to talk about all the pitches in the next session. So, after this one, up together, down together. Next one, sideways, I have a start, circle motion. Just like that. Not for speed, but just a sideways circle. This one really exposes where she has the biggest problem. If she goes around her body, if she jerks her shoulder, this one's gonna really expose it because now she's going full circle, but she doesn't have the extra half of the motion in order to correct herself. So if she's going around her hip, you're gonna really see it on this one. So you gotta get her to slow down, touch her arm to her stomach. Arm to the stomach, okay? Again, she can work on the footwork while she's doing this. She can work on the elbow snap while she's doing this. She can work on the arm touching the ear as she's doing this. All of these things can be worked on simultaneously. So after she does this, and then she does this. Now, let me back up and say on the first one, please notice that I didn't do this. Okay? Because they'll do that if you're not careful. You've got to understand it's about rhythm. Arms and legs moving together. It's like when you throw a ball overhand. Arms and legs move together. Underhand, arms and legs got to move together. Okay? Timing and rhythm gets taught from the beginning of their warm up. So, up together, down together, circle. Now, if you have a pitcher who does this and you want her to start getting away from that, this is where she starts to do it. She brings her hands to her stomach. Tell her she's rocking a baby. Rocking a baby. You're not shaking the crap out of them. <laughs> You just kind of rock it on nice and easy, hands in your glove, and you push your glove right to your target. Push. If she pushes her glove to her target, her arm is not gonna drop out of her glove. Above all else, what you're looking for is to make sure that the ball doesn't drop below her waist. The minute the ball drops below her waist, she's gonna lock her elbow. So, assuming that you get her to not separate her hands and throw the baby behind her, like this, the first thing she's going to do is this. She's going to go and drop her hand down there. She didn't push the glove to the target. She's dropped her hand down. And she does that because muscle memory has trained her to do that. So she's got to go slow in order to not do that. Rock, push, through. Okay. The third and final one that I have them do and I'm sure everybody's seen it or has their pitchers do it already, is the walkthrough pitch. A couple steps back and you walk into it. The whole idea in doing that is to get them to cheat. I want them to get the understanding that the power is in the legs, so the harder she pushes off, the harder she's gonna throw. Same as a baseball pitcher or an outfielder even who tries to get a running start when they're throwing somebody out at home, their power comes from their legs. The more she's gonna get the power going from her legs, the harder she's gonna throw the ball. So you hope that that muscle memory starts to sink itself into her brain that when she has to pitch full motion, she's gonna to try to explode as hard as she possibly can. That's the goal. Those are the only three things that I have them do in the warm-ups. Now obviously if there's mechanical problems, we might have to break something down a little bit more on some things, but with a pitcher that I work with on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis, that's it. That's what I do. Three exercises. All right, well, here's the thing about crow hopping. Crow hopping is not a problem with the feet. Crow hopping is a problem with the hands. Every pitcher that crow hops does a hitch in their arm circle. They go and throw, or they go and throw, or if they keep their hands together, they might go and throw. There is a hitch in their arm circle when they crow hop. So to fix the crow hop, they gotta speed up their hands. If their hands are going fast, the feet do not have time to jump, replant, and push again. It has to keep their momentum going. So if you have a pitcher that crow hops, the best thing you can get her to do is practice with a lighter ball as much as possible to go as fast as she can with her arm circle. Okay, so it's kind of like 
I don't want to go into the whole overloading versus underloading debate. You know, there's some people that don't want to take a heavy bat in the on deck circle. They want to take a light bat, teach themselves fast, fast muscle memory, fast swing, fast swing. But in this case, a lighter ball can really help them because it will promote faster arm serve. Even using wiffle balls will get their arm going faster and faster and faster and faster. So pitchers that crow hop, again, it's not because of the feet. The feet follow the hands. If I don't have this hitch in my arm circle where I go, then my foot does not have a chance to replant. It's that simple. So there's a big misunderstanding about that, about what causes it. And uh, leaping is a different, it's, it's kind of a different thing, but it's not. And I'm going to talk about how to fix leaping in the same, I'll come back to leaping in just one second if you want. Okay? Any other questions on the drills? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Do you recommend using a weighted ball? Um, here's the problem with weighted balls, and I know the internet is an amazing thing, okay? And one of the things about the internet is that there's a lot of message boards and forums where people are dispensing advice that, that may or may not be actually good advice. And a lot of people on the internet tell you that weighted balls are really bad for you. And in my experience, if her mechanics are right, the risk of injury becomes minimal anyway. No matter what, whenever you're doing anything, there's a chance for injury. You, people that tell you that they have 100% they have guarantee that their pitching motion is safe and there's no injuries, okay, yeah. But weighted balls, the problem with weighted balls is that they start to get heavy, obviously, after a couple pitches. And so what you start to see is the girls start to, their circle slows down. And so they start muscling it versus actually working on fast arm circle. So depending on what you're working on is what I would recommend with a weighted ball. Um, weighted balls are really good for working on spins for the different pitches to build, help build up finger strength. But the actual pitching motion, I do very little with weighted balls. Um, and I don't really do anything in lessons with them. I would kind of encourage them maybe to just do the half motion with it where they can really work on the pull down and the snap of their elbow. Uh, that would be beneficial, but the full circle thing, especially in the younger ages, you know, and, and the younger ages are the ones that we really got to worry about. I mean, listen, there's a lot of crazy dads out there. I mean, there, I got a girl and that comes to lessons with me, they just had another baby, he's looking for a 1U travel league that he can get his baby daughter in because the, the, the other one's 12U in playing, and I, I don't want to make her pitch, and I want to get... Dude, I mean, come on. I mean, I know he was kidding, but it, they, they just want to, there's just way too much emphasis put on a lot of this, these training things at young ages, and, and that's why we get so many of the burnouts, you know, girls burn out too quickly. But going back to the weight of all thing, I don't like them going full circle with it, just for the, not so much for the injury factor, but for the fact that I don't want to muscle it. So, yes, sir. You talk about the dragging of your foot and your laces facing facing the catcher. Why do so many pitching coaches teach the banana, you know, the, the curl? The, yeah, and, and going back to Michelle Smith on that picture, Michelle Smith is a figure four finisher. And I think there's a lot of pitchers who finish or they're taught to do something similar to that. And again, from my, what I consider to be common sense, a couple of things happen when a pitcher does the figure four, okay? Both of them aren't exactly what I want. Number one, I'm stopping my forward momentum. And number two, I'm sending part of my momentum a different direction other than where I'm trying to throw the ball. So in a perfect world, I want my foot to drag as straight as possible because I want every bit of my energy going in the direction I'm trying to throw the ball. So why do they teach it? I don't know why it gets taught to do the banana peel or the S or whatever they call it down here. Every pitching coach is a little bit different on what they teach. Ask them why. I mean, I, I really, I, I encourage and, and love it when people ask me why, especially the girls. I want them to ask why because I want them to understand. They're not being disrespectful when they, when they ask why. And I know a lot of pitching coaches that don't want that. They don't want that question why, they just do it. And that's it. Um, I can't explain to you why somebody does. I can explain to you why I don't. Why I don't want them to. Now, it's never gonna be perfect, straight up. Okay, we, we don't live in a perfect world. It's not going to be perfect. But I want it to be as close to perfect as I can possibly get. And the reason I don't is because I want every bit of my energy going towards my target. So I really think the figure four, I think there's pitchers who have had a great amount of success with it. 
I would think that some of them could have had even more success in throwing the ball even harder if they didn't do it. The other problem that I find with the figure four, especially the figure four, and by the figure, everybody know what I mean by the figure four? I mean, they actually pick their leg up and they stop, is that they're not teaching themselves a good hard closure with their hips. I want the hips to close. The question is, when do they close? And just like somebody throwing a ball overhand, when you throw a ball overhand, your arm goes, leg follows. Underhand, same thing. Arm goes, leg follows. And if my leg is staying behind me, then I'm not getting that good torque that I want from my hips. So I do need my hips to close. It's a question of when do it close. And I want them to try to push their hip, or push their hand with their hip. So my arm goes through, hip pushes it. And if I'm getting that chain of events, that thing, those things happening in sequence, then I know I'm getting the power from my body all going in the one direction of where I want the ball to go. And, and it's gonna mean that I'm setting myself up to be able to throw the pitches. And I'm gonna go into the rise ball and probably in the next session, we'll work almost there, in the next session, because it's the most complicated pitch to do. And I wanna make sure that everybody understands why it's so complicated and, and all that. So let me just rush through this here real quick. Spins, I'll get in more into the spins of the pitches in the next session. So there's my tease, so hopefully everybody comes back. <laughs> Qualifications. Pitching coach. There are a thousand pitching coaches in the world. There might even be a thousand in your neighborhood. Everybody who's had a daughter that pitches suddenly miraculously becomes a pitching coach. It happens all the time. Everybody's got a good heart. There isn't anybody that's doing anything or teaching anything that, that is doing it maliciously or with, with bad intent. But what are they actually teaching? Make sure you're not staying with your pitching coach because you like them or because they have a good rapport with your daughter. Make sure the material that they're teaching them makes sense. A lot of times we get confused and caught up in that emotion part where ah, she really likes this pitching coach. Yeah, but why is she teaching her to do this when Cat Osterman does not do this? Why is she teaching her to do slam the door when Michelle Smith doesn't slam the door? Ask those questions. If you do it in the right context and in the right frame, you're not being rude. So, um, and again, does what you're learning match with the best in the world we're doing? The mechanics are the same for all the pitchers, best in the world, male and female. They're using the same motions. 